on this episode of The Darker Side of Boxing. We're telling the story of a former professional boxer turned bodyguard to the stars, bouncer on nightclubs, a man not to be messed with, who would have his independence taken away from him in a road traffic collision, which would lead to the ultimate demise and the grotesque murder by his friend and carer. This is the murder of of Sean the Governor Cummins. Well, it's another episode for the darker side of boxing. This is a story that has really compelled both myself and Johnston, to sit down and investigate and really bring to the forefront of the boxing media world. It's something that has been covered at the time, but I don't think it was as high profile as, as what you'd expect this one to be. This is more like a, a small scale case, but actually the magnitude of what happened in this particular case is so high profile, it's unruly. This is all about a former professional boxer by the name of Sean Cummins. And we're going to be discussing his life inside the ring and, of course, his life outside of the ring and what led to this particular episode. Johnston, I know we've done the research, we've done the investigations. What an episode this is going to be for the fight fans. This is certainly going to be one that will have your toes curling. It certainly will do that. It is a incredible story about a guy that I didn't know too much about it was a story that, that, that you found, Sean, and we, we ended up <laughs> looking at all the details and it just ticked all the boxes for the dark side of boxing. But it is a very grotesque story. And, and I mean, even Donald McIntyre, who does the documentaries, if people will know him, actually, he summed it up brilliantly. I mean, he called it a shocking crime, very graphic and hugely distressing. And he basically hit the nail on the head. That's what this story is. It certainly is that. And of course, with the darker side of boxing, we'd like to give you a bit of context to, to how this particular story came about. So we're talking about this gentleman by the name of Sean Cummins, a professional boxer. But before that, of course, we're going to start by talking about his beginnings in the suburbs of Leicester here in the UK. And he was born on February the 8th, 1968. Lived in Leicester pretty much all of his life. Now, we talked about his boxing career he did begin as an amateur out of the Belgrave Amateur Boxing Club and began his professional career at the age of 18, making his debut against Michael Justin, who was one and two. And that was at the Loughborough Town Hall on September the 29th, 1986, winning on points in a six-round contest. Now, Cummins won his next five fights, with two coming inside the distance, before picking up his first loss, against Frank Grant, who was 6-1, and one, when he was forced to retire due to a cut and swelling around the left eye. Now, in terms of his beginnings, Johnson, there wasn't a lot for us to be able to source in terms of his early life. A lot of the episodes that we cover for this series on our career profiles, we're able to find a lot of context to what's happened growing up for, for, for these particular individuals in the episodes. But with Sean Cummins, it was really difficult for us to be able to source who this man really was, what his upbringing was really like. So a lot of the the pretext to the episode is based on information as as he was and as he was known during his boxing career and outside of the ring. And that's that's exactly it. It was it was really tricky being such a I suppose a, a small all fire. Um, you know, he boxed a lot a lot of the times in and around the Leicester area. So to find to source information on, on on a guy that is very low profile in the boxing scene, it and and also in the in the sort of in late eighties and going into the nineties, there just isn't wasn't enough information on online. I mean, we probably could have, you know, if we'd have popped to the library and started pulling off articles and newspaper rules, we could probably find a little bit more about it. But unfortunately, we just don't have the time to do that. Well, hopefully, we uh, we will be able to at some point if we start earning a bit of money in doing this, but <laughs> it's, it's tricky. It was really hard. So we had to just literally source the boxing stuff. And so, yeah, he did. He won his next two bouts before being stopped yet again on cuts, something that seemed to happen quite regularly with um, Cummins. And 
This time was over both his eyes and it was uh, against Kasim Clayton. He was a 10-8 and 2 guy. Now Cummins brought his career record to respectable 10 and 2 with five knockouts by April 1990 which gave him the opportunity to fight for the vacant Midlands area super welterweight title against a guy called Wally Swift Jr who was 18 at 7 and 1. He actually lost his fight. It was a very very close fight. And referee Adrian Morgan actually scored the belt 97 and a half to 98 for Swift, wow. meaning Cummins missed out by half a point and, and obviously missed out on that the Midlands area super welterweight title. So the Midlands area super welterweight title is as it says on the tin, really. For anybody outside of the UK, you know, you have like all you different sort of intercontinentals, you have your USBAs, your NABFs in America. This is like the equivalent of that, really, when you put it into that type of context. An area title is based on the area in the UK. So you've got like the central area, the Midlands, you've got the southern area titles, you've got the Scottish titles, you've got all these different titles that you can actually go on to win as a professional before you step up to the big leagues in the UK. So he just missed out on that Midlands area title there. Now in his next fight, he took on former British title contender, Paul Wesley, who was 10, 10 and 3 at the Civic Hall in Wolverhampton. Now, it's at this point a darker side began to emerge in Cummins' career and his life. Allegations actually surfaced afterwards, after he beat Wesley in the first round via knockout, that he'd actually racially abused Wesley in the dressing room before the fight and he even had to be physically restrained from attacking his opponent before they'd even got in the ring. Yeah, a story that we managed to source there. It's, it's clearly something not quite right. I mean, Cummins, I mean, there are allegations. This is something that will that will crop up again soon. But yeah, uh, an interesting story. I mean, there are like allegations to, to Paul Wesley. I mean, Paul Wesley, I couldn't find the information from him. I was hoping we could find something from him. But yeah, something not quite right with Cummins there. And, and we do start to delve into his darker side, as you mentioned. And stuff like this began to happen, unfortunately, for him. Um, he wasn't very well liked, to be quite honest with you, Aaron. So Cummins did have a reputation uh, for being difficult to deal with. And he certainly made a few enemies inside the boxing business and also outside the ring too. And But he was, uh, as I said, he just wasn't a very nice person. Um, and many people had some not so nice things to say when they spoke of him, even though he's no longer with us. Now, following the racial accusations, Sean's boxing career began to improve with six victories and a draw between 1990 and 1992. So his record now was a very respectable 17 wins, three losses and one draw with 11 knockouts. On November the 28th, 1992, Cummins defeated Manchester's very own Steve the Viking Foster, who was 14-10-2 at the time, by a split decision to win the WBA Pentacontinental Super Welterweight title at the GMX Centre. Cummins defended his title against the former Commonwealth champion Mickey Hughes, who was 24 and 6, with a stoppage in the 11th. So at this point in his boxing career, things are starting to take uh, an upward trajectory for him. He's actually getting these these good victories over well-known names on the boxing circuit. And although Steve Foster's records 14 and 10 and Mickey Hughes is 24 and 6, it doesn't really reflect what these fighters were like at the time. Anybody who was around boxing at the time or remembers what boxing was like at the time know that all the fighters wouldn't really avoid anybody and they'd all fight each other and losses weren't as protected back then as what they are now. So Sean's career at this point is going on this great trajectory and it's looking like he's potentially going to go further forward in his career. Yeah, and you saying that, I mean, Mikey Hughes, this is a fight that's actually on YouTube. You can watch There's a couple of fights on there and one in his early career with Barry McGuigan's on there. And Barry McGuigan speaks, you know, from what he's seen of him, he spoke quite highly of him and said sort of that, that he, he would, he could potentially be a decent fighter. And this was the point where he was starting to showcase that he had some ability, that he had some boxing skills. The other thing with Cummins is that he was a bit of a fan favourite. They loved to see him. He just loved a scrap. He was he was a great, you know, if you like that sort of thing, as as many of us do, he's a guy that would go in and, and, and go for it, basically. And you knew he was going to get with him. And Mikey Hughes actually had fought Lloyd Hunnigan just before. He'd lost to Lloyd Hunnigan. Mikey, and if this was his last fight, Mikey Hughes was a good fighter, a better fighter than, again, you know, some people may look at his score 24-6 and, and he retires. But 
a good fighter fought a lot of guys who you know who put nowadays they wouldn't have fought. So this that was that was the era and. Sean did skip past the middleweight division for his next two fights. And he actually fought super middleweight. He actually won one and lost one on the undercards. The first one that he won was on the undercard of Billy Shaw. And then um, the second fight that he lost, he was actually on the undercard of Steve Collins and Prince Nazim Hamid. So two big names there. And maybe this is where whoever was following the Collins and Nazim Hamid at the time would have seen Cummins and and liked what they see. Because although he got beaten, Again, you know, he, he was good fun to watch. Now, from this, even though he had been defeated, he did get the European middleweight shot against an undefeated Italian called Agostino Cardamine. Now, he was 22-0, and 0, and this happened in San Remo. Now, an opponent that Sean didn't really want to fight, he actually had been told that he's potentially going to be fighting a certain someone else. And this is when he was speaking to Steve Bunce, uh, Steve Bunce in 2010. And this is what, what Sean Cummings said. And he said, that was not even the fight I wanted. I was offered a world title fight. And I said, yes, before I was even told the opponent. It was, it turns out, Steve Collins. I would have beaten him, he said. It never happened. And I went off to Italy. I was foolish back then. So he potentially had a shot against Steve Collins, obviously on the undercard, maybe because he was beaten, that fight didn't happen. Who knows? But he could have had that big, big fight. But instead, he went off to Italy to fight Cardamine. Now, he reflected on his failed title challenge on the Italian Riviera. And he said, I hit him with a left hook. But sadly, the right missed as he was going down. Bunce was ringside for the fight and he described the moments Sean Cummins put the European champion down and Steve Bunce has quoted as saying, I watched in disgust as the defending champion, a local fighter, was given every chance to clear his head. It was a long and disgraceful count and Cardamone survived the round and retained his title. Cardamone was over for nearly 30 seconds. Now the fight went the full 12 rounds but... Cardamone, of course, being in Italy, he took the verdict. Yeah, shocking one, that by the sounds of it. The fact that they're long count, 30 seconds. Uh, Steve Bunce, I'm sure he was going to be there to back Cummins. Clearly, something not quite right, and it, it went the, the, the Italians' way. Now, um, after the Cardamine fight, there was one final local showdown against Burton's Neville Brown, who was 28 and 3, for the British middleweight title in Moorways Leisure Centre in Derby. Now, once again, Steve Bunce, uh, this is in that interview in 2010, they spoke about this fight and he spoke about this fight. He was also there and he called it a stunning and dramatic night, a local brawl for bragging rights and not for the skirmish. Brown did actually stop Cummings in the fifth in what would be his last professional fight on November 10, 1995. Now, his Facebook page Actually, these these are sort of this is this is where we're talking about where we're really scratching. I had to try and find some information. Now, his Facebook page actually spoke of the defeat, and it said to this day the defeat versus Neville Brand still upsets and angers Cummings, as he truly feels he should not have taken the fight with a damaged left hand and underestimating Neville Brown. But it is what it is, and although the governor that was his nickname at the time, Sean the Governor Cummings, never did. Come anywhere near to the fight up. Many experts like Barry McGuigan had predicted he would. He still was one hell of a fighter. And as I say, he was a real fan's favourite. They love to watch him. Now, he does actually have a Facebook page, which is still up on Facebook. You can actually go and find the Facebook page. It's Sean, the Governor Cummins, which is something, I think, between himself and someone around him were running uh, around the back end of 2009, 2010. And on that Facebook page, he actually alluded to his favourite victories uh, as those over former Olympic bronze medalist and super middleweight champion Richie Woodall amateur boxing association champion Terry Vellanor and ABA finalist Brian Robinson and Terry Morrill. So he's talking about these fights that he'd had previously to, to turning professional and victories that he said he, he actually picked up whilst he was an amateur. Now, he actually never retired from boxing per se. It was actually a failed brain scan that forced him to quit the ring in 1995, ending his career. And he had a record of 22 wins, six losses, and a draw. Now, six years later, 
he was granted a license from the Irish Boxing Union to continue boxing after he was cleared to fight again in 2001, but it actually never materialised. A fight was never scheduled. He never ended up actually getting back in the ring again, although he had all the best intentions of, of being able to box once more. Yeah, and there was a, there was another article that I did find where he, a, a very small one at that, but he did discuss the fact of, of him returning around this time. Um, and he, he seemed quite eager and, and he did sort of say that he was finding he had found it difficult um, in the time between ninety five and two thousand and one, where he wasn't fighting. But that was what it was, and and we'll go into that now in terms of what he what happened with Sean during his retirement and and after boxing, Sean found it difficult to readjust, and he actually became depressed, and he had no real direction in his life. Been boxing for as long as he was, he was still quite young. He could have fought on. And he's obviously going to find it difficult, but he did find bodybuilding, which gave him desire and drive again. And he actually bulked up. It was over, I think he was six foot one, just over six foot. And he bulked up to 18 stone. Now, obviously, his new frame then got him into work as a bodyguard and a debt collector and a doorman at nightclubs in the local area. Now, he did actually rub shoulders with such, with, with not, not massive stars, but they were stars such as guys like Lee Ryan, for people that, don't know Lee Ryan, he was in the boy band Blue, who were among his clients. But he also mingled with some unsavoury characters. And Sean did speak in an interview with The Independent. And he said, after boxing, I made a few errors in life. And I did a bit of bird. I wanted to fight, but there were a lot of things going on in my life. Not all good. I look back and I have a lot of regrets. I was a bit wild. I've made my apologies over the years. So what he's alluding to there is a few incidents which happened whilst he was a 18 stone brick shit house, (laughs) basically bodyguarding for local boy band stars such as Lee Ryan out of blue and being a doorman on the local nightclubs. So in 1997, he was jailed for six months after assaulting and racially abusing an Asian doctor who was attempting to treat his newborn son. In an article written by Mitt Lockley in 2012 for Birmingham Live, he described Sean's new life after boxing and he said, He was a violent, volatile man in a violent, volatile world. Much, much darker than the bloody boxing business. So you're getting to understand at this point that things are going from probably bad to worse, I would say, at this point where he's getting involved in all sorts of altercations. A lot of them are not obviously reported, but you can imagine him being a bouncer, being a doorman in a club when you're getting someone who comes up to you and he's trying to provoke you. A lot of these bouncers are quite heavy handed and you see many videos go viral of bouncers literally only slapping some five stone wet through 18 year old lad and they're absolutely putting him on the floor. So you can imagine a guy who's just over six foot, 18 stone built like a brick shit house. He's going to do some damage when he's on them doors, surely. Yeah, and, and the fact that he knows how to throw a punch as well definitely helped his calls. And, and the fact that he was such a, a ruthless fighter in the ring, as he was by the sounds of it on the street, and he was a little bit wild, as he said. Some people described him as really wild and, and, and very self centered, and he knew what he wanted. He knew he, what he, he, that's precisely basically what it was. He knew what he wanted to do, and if anyone disagreed or they didn't want to join him, then it was that sort of attitude of sort of fuck him. I'm going to do it anyway. And and he had that spiral from the ring where he was, you know, he was slightly depressed. He bulks himself up. Next thing you know, he's rubbing with the stars, he's rubbing with some some unsavory fellas. You know, you're not you're going to be either a star or you're going to be in a bit of trouble if you're asking someone for bodyguard or debt collecting. Which uh, I believe the debt collecting that he did wasn't necessary. It was the ones where the the normal debt collectors that we would have over the phone they wouldn't bring on, they wouldn't take on. So you can imagine him knocking on doors and, and extorting people for, for a bit of money and, and you're going to say no to him. He's, you know, he's six foot 18 stone fella and he can punch. He was living a good life and, and he had found something other than boxing, obviously trying to go back in in 2001, never materialised, probably because he was a bit too big. I mean, what weight would he have gone in in 2001 if he did get back in the ring? It definitely wouldn't have been a suit middleweight. God knows what it would have been. It was an interesting time. Now, things were going to take a dramatic turn at this point in time. He was in, like he said, Johnson, he's enjoying himself, he's having a great time doing what he's doing. But in 2004, 
Sean was riding his motorcycle on the A6 in Burstall, Leicester, when on his way back from the gym. Someone actually pulled out of a side road in front of him. He swerved out of the way, but he was thrown forward off his bike and straight through the back window of a large four-wheel drive. And Sean recalled, I saved her life. He was released after four months in hospital and was in good spirits after the accident, boasting to his friends, I've still not been knocked out, I remain conscious throughout, but his condition worsened when a cut on his backside became infected. His attitude changed quickly. He was paralysed from the chest down and unable to do the simplest task for himself. He was high on medication to numb the pain and would need help to do the simplest of things for the rest of his life. And as a result of that, he ended up putting loads of weight on. He became obese and was quite depressed. So he then decides to turn to a friend, a long-time friend by the name of Thomas Dunkley, who ended up becoming his full-time carer. The father of two, Thomas Dunkley, actually quit his job at the age of 29 so he could look after his mate and was promised to be paid well. But that never materialised for Thomas Dunkley. And things, of course, would take an even more sinister turn as we go through the course of the story. Yeah, interesting, Thomas Dunkley. He was a guy that was part of a a trust fund. So for the, from the accident, obviously, it wasn't Sean's fault. Sean was eventually awarded £369,000 compensation for that accident, with the payout going to a trust fund that was managed by advisors who allowed him to spend it, spend it however he wished. And... I believe Thomas Dunkley was a part of that compensation team or he worked for him, but he was a friend. He'd always been a friend of Sean's. So I suppose it made sense at the time if, if he's a mate of his, he's working for this, this company and he's a carer in a way of such, or he's I'm not quite sure if he was an actual carer or if he was just in that business. Uh, I'm not quite sure because again, you just can't find that material. So you're just sort of filling in the gray areas and, it seems like he was a friend. He had been working for this company and uh, he got this conversation money and it was like, will you be my full-time carer kind of thing? And he sort of accepted. So one thing with Sean, though, he did continue his lo- to live a lavish lifestyle and he, he did buy a specially adapted Porsche. But as time went by, he did become more and more withdrawn. He would go out less and he would not associate with his friends. If you want to call some of his friends, some of the quotes from his friends uh, can be, uh, you wouldn't necessarily think they're his friends. I think he just wasn't the nicest person to be around. So he just didn't have many. So he became, as a result of that, he, he he was in a depressive state. And this is where he would spend most of his time at home in his bedroom. Obviously immobile not able to do the things he wanted to do, was hoping he could pull himself through and make a full recovery. The doctors never gave him that hope, but he just had that in his in his mind that he was going to get through it. But he was a big lad, you know, he's a, he was a bodybuilder, he had an upper strength. But somewhere along the line at this point, even though he had this £360,000 compensation, he just, yeah, he spent it and he spent most of it during the course of the next eight years. But, he just didn't have the people around him, I suppose, to, to get him up and get him going and push himself through. And in the end, as I say, he just sort of sat in the bedroom and become very depressed and, and basically just isolated himself. Well, this is it. At this point in time, you got to remember there's a lot of pride in, in being a professional boxer and to not even be able to do what you once did anymore in general in life must have been difficult. To be able to not get back in the boxing ring was difficult for him, as as we've heard throughout the course of some of the quotes from the interviews. Now, he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. He gets depressed. He gets into that state where he's becoming quite agoraphobic. He doesn't want to go out anywhere. He doesn't want his care, to Thomas Dunkley, to take him out anywhere. He's literally just sitting at home being quite depressed and just sitting in a state where he's, he's, there's just nothing, there's just nothing going on for him at all. Now, anybody that's been in that sort of state of mind before can probably relate to, to what it's like to be in that state of mind. It's not a great place to be in. And he was in that state of mind at this point in time. Now, his carer, Thomas Dunkley, was looking after him for a period of time without actually re- receiving any payment. Now, a few years following this payout had happened things then was start to take an even more 
sinister turn and a more downward spiral. On September the 2nd, 2012, a community nurse made one of her regular visits to see Sean when she was greeted at the door by his carer and friend, Thomas Dunkley. Now, he turned her away by informing the nurse that Sean had been taken to hospital. She was not suspicious in any way because Sean had actually been unwell recently and it was very possible that Sean indeed was was at the hospital. Ten days later, the community nurse phoned Sean's home to check on his progress and Dunkley answered the call. It was this telephone conversation on September the 12th that raised concerns with the nurse. The first thing Dunkley did when he answered the phone was impersonate Sean. And of course, like anybody would, you'd find that to be quite odd behaviour. So the nurse then decides to take things a little further. She's becoming even more suspicious about what's going on and she starts to begin her own investigations as her instincts was that something wasn't right. She began making inquiries, ringing around a number of hospitals in the West Midlands and Dudley area, and even contacted Sean Cummins' GP, but there were no record of Sean being admitted into any hospital. Suspicions then at this point, even more heightened, and then she decides that, I'm going to ring the police now. There's there's something not right here. Even the police tried to contact Dunkley, but they didn't even get a response as well. Yes, I mean, clearly, I mean, this, this by the sounds of it, the community nurse would go around once a week. So she's gone around on the second and he's, he's told her to go away. I suppose, you know, if he's unwell, that's something that we'll discuss in a minute. He, he was unwell and we will we'll give you exactly why he wasn't well. It, it seemed to be legit. But the fact that he's <laughs> very suspicious when he's, when he's answering the phone and trying to impersonate Sean, straight away you're thinking something absolutely is not right. Now, she's, as, you, as you mentioned, Sean, she's called the police. The police tried to call Dunkley. Nothing. So that evening, on September 12, 2012, two police officers went to see 45-year-old Sean Cummins, who lived in a bungalow on Marriott Road in Leicester. After no answer, they forced entry into the property. Now, the first thing they were confronted with was the smell of death. They knew straight away... Two police officers would have been in a situation like this before and they knew that they were now looking for a dead body. And that smell, that this, that horrific smell that there is described by in uh, Donald McIntyre's documentary led them to four fridge freezers. What they found was quite simply horrifying. There were several decomposed body parts wrapped in black bin bags and taped with duct tape and stuffed into fridge freezers. One package was actually opened by one of the senior police officers that then came along, obviously once they called for backup, and that package revealed the head of Sean Cummins. There was no sign of a struggle, no forced entry, no sign of a fight or a disturbance, which led to believe that Sean must have let his, his killer into the bungalow when he was murdered. Oh, wow. Crazy. Well, it's just taking an even more sinister turn. We've gone from one extreme to another here, haven't we? We've gone from the fact that Sean Cummins is depressed, he's in a depressive state, and the next thing you know, his carer is trying to impersonate calls, he's avoiding everybody, he's not wanting to answer the door, not wanting to answer the phone, the police have had no choice but to go and investigate further. I don't even know what the smell of death smells like, to be honest with you. I can't honestly say I've, I've ever had to smell that smell. Now, going into that environment where the police officers are experienced, they're walking in and straight away they knew looking for a body. Straight away they know they've got a, a, a potential murder inquiry. But then it gets even worse, the fact that they have to go to four fridges and open the fridges and there are body parts in different sections of the fridge... So, Sean Cummins' body has basically been absolutely mutilated and put into fridge freezers and left to actually decompose. It wasn't even, they wasn't even frozen. They were decomposing. It's just been shoved in a fucking freezer and left to decompose. This is the sign of an absolute psychopath. But then it begs the question, who's done this? Who killed Sean Cummins? Yeah, and I mean, they... 
the, the police, the, the, the police officers that did arrive on the scene, they actually describe when opening one of them fridge doors and the smell actually, it, it threw them back. Like this was clearly, it, it had been in the, in the fridge freezers for a very long time. Uh, well, for for several days, the fact that that smell is, I, I dread to think. I mean, it must have been awful. And as you said, I mean, that was the biggest question. So, who who killed Sean? And the investigation team began to build a profile on Sean, so they could try to figure out who indeed wanted to kill him, and not only kill him, but chop him into ten pieces. Now, those ten pieces, to I don't mean to be graphic, but you know, this this is what this is: the dark side of boxing. He was actually cut from his ankles, both his feet taken off from his knees. He was actually cut in half. One of his arm was, I think, his hand was chopped off, and then. It was from the elbow chopped off, but one of the other ones was just chopped off halfway from, from the elbow or maybe on the bicep and his head chopped off. That was all the 10 pieces. So, I mean, you've got to be absolutely off your rocker to even be doing this. I mean, it sounds more like a mob style hit. There, what you read of it in books and what we've seen in, mo- in movies like Goodfellas or whatever, you know, when they cut their victims and then just to make it easy for them to move and dispose of body parts in different places, it just, you're not normal to be doing this to somebody. And it is just, I mean, it's horrific. I mean, the form of it is just absolutely baffling. And what the hell? And who did it? I mean, that's that's the next question that that we're going to try and we'll give you the evidence what we've discovered. So the post-mortem was actually delayed because they actually had to wait for his body parts to fully defrost all of the body parts were then placed back together in the correct order so that it would look like one body and be examined in the normal way. And that would have been a fucking horrible job to do, to be able to put them body parts oh. back together. All the body parts were present, but it's, it's trying to establish now for, for the coroners, you know, was he actually murdered before he was dismembered or was the dismemberment what caused him to, to pass away as a result of them injuries clearly sustained. And this is this is what they're trying to find out. And of course, who the fuck's done this? Who in the right mind has done this? Now, the police got their first big break when they delved into Sean's accident, which brought to light a possible motive. His trust fund at the time of the murder now stood at 44,000. So remember, he had 369,000. It's now gone right down to 44,000, which is still a significant amount of money. And it's still enough for a motive for somebody to actually want to kill him as well. Now, police looked into his life after boxing when he was a minder and a doorman. And he's got to look at the sort of people he was around at the time and any potential enemies that could have wanted him dead. Working in that sort of environment could quite easily lead for someone wanting to do this to him. Now, in an article written in The Independent by Steve Bunt in 2012, he alluded to the possible reason when he wrote, Cummins had, so the court was told, criminal connections. It seemed to me that it was more like the governor had criminal bad luck. Now, Mick Lockley, again, who writes for the Birmingham Live, sourced one close associate of Sean's who said, when he died... The people who spoke well of him were usually the people who didn't know him. The only people who disliked Cummings more than the public were the criminals. He wasn't a gangster because he didn't get on with anyone. He was a genuine hard man and he lived fast. A car journey with Shaw Cummings, you didn't need a roller coaster. He drove like a nutter. He was a reckless sort of character. If you mix in the circles Cummings mixed in, you're a bit worried about who's on your side. And who isn't? He knew I was on his side, though. Yeah, very interesting that that first. I mean, as as I said, I mean, when when you hear a body being dismembered like that, the first thing you think of is like something like the mob. So you can understand where Steve Bunce, you know, writing this article all the time, he's thinking, well, you know, it's criminal. Is it someone in in the underworld has has got rid of him, chopped him up into bits, and and then Mick Lockley from Berman and Live, you know, from the source he spoke to, clearly, as we said. Earlier on, he wasn't a nice guy. People just didn't warm to him. He, he, I don't think he cared too much. And then when he had the accident, you know, people weren't there to support him because he was very, very on his own and he didn't really care for too much about people. So you could, I mean, with with the police trying to build a profile now on Sean, they knew themselves that universally he was not a light person. You know, that that was as simple as that. And 
And the uh, former detective inspector, who was Simon Shuttleworth, who actually led the Sean Cummings murder investigation, he looked into it. Obviously, you know, looking at these articles and, and, and friends and family spoke of what Sean was like. And, and he said that the very fact that Sean Cummings, an ex-boxer, an ex-doorman and bodyguard, was found dead set my mind racing as to what the connections are. Was there an organised crime link? Was it a link to his work as a bodyguard? Has he upset somebody? Has he fallen out with somebody? Money is often the root of these things. So that is where we would go initially. But when they did, he said there was nothing. By looking into the history, into his history, police were unable to find any significant evidence to link Sean's murder of criminal organisation or person. So they eliminated that almost immediately, that that wasn't a possible reason for his murder. And police began to instead, they followed the money trail in hope that it would lead them to a possible suspect. So at this point now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, the only other person that is anywhere near Sean and who's already done some suspicious things is his carer, who was the lead suspect now in the case, which was Thomas Dunkley. Now, Thomas Dunkley, when they went to look for him, uh, he'd gone into thin air. He'd fucked off. And remember, he'd actually never been paid by Sean Cummins for his carer work. And in fact, when the police locked into his history, he was actually 16 grand in debt. So straight away, alarm bells are ringing. You're thinking, well, that's the guy. This guy's in debt. This guy's got 44 grand sat in his account. Of course he's going (laughs) to fucking murder him. Of course, that is the motive there and then. Now, while police conducted the removal of Sean's body, they were tipped off that Dunkley had been spotted near the premises, actually watching them. So he's watching the police remove all these body parts and all the forensics there at the time. Now, what police later discovered was that Dunkley had placed sensors around the house so he would be notified if someone was in the residence. So then police went to Dunkley's house to carry out a search, but they were actually unable to find any evidence that he had planned or plotted the murder of Sean Cummings. However, he's still at this point mysteriously missing. Yeah, and um, when it was was in, I'm, I'm guessing, again, Fitted in the, the grey areas here, but police were then later um, informed by another source. And now I'm, I'm probably guessing here that it was probably a family member when they went and done the search of his house and while conducting while conducting the search. And that bit of information was given was that Mr. Dunkley had borrowed his brother's car. So they now knew what, what car they were looking for. So they began sort of, they began tracing the CCTV. He was, now basically being treated as a fugitive on the run for murder. So while unbeknown to, to, to Dunkley, they he doesn't know the police know what car he's driving. They now know and they actually catch him heading towards the M1 on the CCTVs and uh, license plate recognition. So they were tracking him throughout the evening. And it was, I believe it was like the early hours of the morning. It was when finally the West Yorkshire police actually found the vehicle. It was in a secluded area of a car park at a services station. So armed police were quick to respond, but they were obviously approaching Mr. Dunkley with caution, not knowing if he's got weapons himself. When you when you think how gruesome that what's happened to Sean, you, you, you're going to be approaching this a bit in an eerie way. So they actually got uh, air support for guidance as well. And you can, again, this is on the, the documentary on YouTube and, you can actually see the arrest and, and they've got the helicopter in the sky and they move in and Thomas Dunkley comes out of his car, hands up, lays down on the deck. Uh, you can see him, they're the armed response unit, they've got guns and they arrest him for the murder of Sean Cummings. Now, Detective Inspector Simon Shuttleworth led a team that could now conduct their interrogation of Thomas Dunkley, but they had only 24 hours to gather enough evidence to charge him of the murder or they would have to let him go. Even though the evidence clearly pointed towards Dunkley, it was all circumstantial. So they had hoped for a confession. In the interview, Thomas Dunkley gave a statement saying that Sean Cummings had died of natural causes. Now, instead of calling 999 like most people would have done and informing the authorities, he said that he'd panicked and he decided to go to a hardware store, get some tools together. And like you do, 
you cut him into ten pieces. <laughs> now, he was not able to give a plausible explanation as to why the hell he would do such a thing, but he categorically and calmly told the police that he didn't kill Sean Cummins. So, let's have this right. He's then telling the police that the first thing I did when I panicked was I went to the hardware store and there is actually CCTV footage of him in the hardware store. And that footage is still on YouTube, scarily enough, of him going into the hardware store to pick up the tools that he needed to go and conduct this this grisly crime that he, that he, that he went and committed. So the problem is now, they've got to prove it. They've got to prove he, he's actually done it. He's saying he's got the tools together and cut him into 10 pieces, but there's no actual evidence as such that he killed him. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, how mad is that? That you've got Sean Cummins in cut into ten pieces, you know, wrapped in black body bags and, and wrapped up with duct tape, stuck in fridge freezers, and yet they they can't possibly tell you the cause of death, which is obviously something we're now going to go into, and and it was trying to prove the murder. Now, so evidence from the pathologist was unable to clarify just how Sean had been killed, but DCI Simon Shuttleworth. He was informed by this pathologist that the damage caused was by a chainsaw, by the way. Now, this, the chainsaw masked any other injuries that may have already been there, which prevented him from identifying the cause of death. So if there were any other marks on the body of Sean's, you know, by him chopping him into so many bits, there was no way they could actually identify a specific area where he was murdered so if he was ever caught in the neck he was or an archery and you've been dismembered from that point you're not going to find it and this meant that there was no conclusive evidence that could prove sean cummins was murdered by mr dunkley which in effect could have resulted in him getting off on a technicality now professor vanizes said that sean had been suffering from pneumonia and bladder and kidney infections when he died, and it might have killed him. It might not have killed him. There is no evidence of any injuries, but I can't rule out foul play, says Professor Venises. He also believed that Cummings had died four days before his body was dismembered. So the plot thickens, really, because now you've got a professor basically saying that he was suffering from pneumonia, and bladder and kidney infections, which could have actually killed him, but they might not have killed him, but there's no evidence of any injuries, but you can't rule out foul play. So you're getting told one thing, but then getting contradicted in the same sentence. So now you're thinking, seriously, like, is this guy, is this guy's going to get away with this? Now, police needed, of course, to gather enough evidence that the murder was premeditated if they were going to get a conviction, and, and Dunkley's debt and Cummins' trust fund was a good place to start. What they quickly established was that Dunkley had possession of all Sean Cummins' accounts since March 2012, and he had been secretly spending his money behind his back. The bank accounts also shown that Dunkley had been paying for loans in Sean's name and using Sean's credit cards. Payments continued beyond September the 2nd, 2012, the day the police believed Sean Cummins was murdered, but they took on a different picture. Now, Dunkley was spotted on CCTV withdrawing cash from Sean's account for direct spending, rather than just the wire transactions he was exploiting before. So he was now going out, and he was buying designer clothes, and presents for his family, and he even paid for a mortgage advisor, and then went out and put a deposit down on a brand new Vauxhall as well. And police managed to work out that Sean's body was not dismembered until about five days after he was murdered. On September the 7th, 2012... Dunkley was spotted once again on CCTV, this time buying a chainsaw, a face mask, protective clothing and an incinerator. And he was then chillingly caught on camera with his young daughter buying one of the fridge freezers that he was going to use to store Sean Cummins' body parts. Oh, it's absolutely grim, isn't it? I mean, the, uh, the, the inspector that was on the lead case here, he... When when he said when he see the video of him with his girl holding holding her hand and uh, and buying a a fridge freezer, he said it was just it was one of the most chilling things he's ever seen and just that's just absolutely crazy, isn't it? And the fact that he's buying designer clothes, buying presents for his family, and his family even said he was in debt. They knew he was in debt. He never had no money. All of a sudden, he's buying them gifts. They knew something's not quite right. 
I mean, what the hell was this guy on? Obviously, completely, uh, he's not right in the head, quite simply. And and the evidence that police were now able to compile against Dunkley was was now condemning, and it was it was very it was closing on him. But it didn't stop there. He was actually spotted by neighbours using that incinerator he had purchased in the garden burning evidence and the evidence he was burning was that the protective clothing he would have used when he was chainsawing Cummings up into little bits and also the sheets he used to clean up the murder scene there was even a neighbor that mentioned the fact that he could smell burning flesh in one of the incinerators but he just didn't think it'd be a, a, a body I mean who does I suppose and but with all this evidence you know he's been caught on camera he's, he's stealing money they've got him on fraud 100% they've got him on fraud but there was nothing concrete. They could not use this evidence in a court of law to convict Dunkley for the murder of Sean Cummings. So with all the information they still have, they still cannot ascertain how Sean died and they didn't have the evidence to prosecute Thomas Dunkley for his murder. Even regardless of all the other stuff that we've just we've just speaking about. This guy is in a position where he can still get away with it, even though he's done all this. It's incredible. So our attentions then turned to a computer where they were hoping that they could find and Dunkley had searched ways to kill someone, but initial findings were not conclusive. Now, Detective Inspector Shuttleworth continued his search and found that the hard drive on the computer had been corrupted and there was no way of getting any more information. Now, instead of accepting the verdict, Shuttleworth decided then to outsource the computer to a private company to be absolutely 100% sure that there was nothing else on that hard drive. The private company, Disk Labs, were actually able to finally extract the information from the damaged hard drive. And what was discovered was that Thomas Dunkley had, had indeed been searching on ways to kill another human. And D.I. Shuttleworth spoke of the evidence that they managed to pull off the hard drive. And he said, what happens when somebody's dead? How long does it take before a body starts to smell? What happens if you inject bleach into the veins? There were quite a number of sick searches. The dates of all the searches were also able to be pinpointed to before the nurse even raised the alarm and was the proof that Dunkley had been planning murder. This was exactly the sort of evidence that they needed to prove that it was premeditated and it would end up becoming the key bit of evidence that would convict Thomas Dunkley. So he finally paid off. The fact that Detective Inspector Shuttleworth wasn't happy when he initially sent it off to a forensic, it's like a forensics, uh, electronic forensic side of the police department and and he wasn't happy with, with the reports they come back with. And he, and he pursued, he said, no, he wasn't happy with it. You know, you can't just not have a hard drive that you can't extract any more information off. And uh, to go to his private company, this labs, I mean, he's big, that this labs big time. They, they managed to get all this information and also pinpoint the precise dates he was using it. I mean, finally, they've got information that they could clearly see that Thomas was thinking of these crazy ways of injecting bleach into his veins or, I mean, what the hell? I mean, this guy clearly had some serious issues and, and the fact that he wasn't getting paid by Thomas for the care he had been providing over the few years is, and clearly in debt does not give you the reason to start whatever, he, however he done it. I mean, the other the other possibility is that he suffocated him, but he was a big guy, heavy on the top. So he, he, was, he wasn't as big as um, coming. So I think that would have been Hard to, for him to have done. You know, this guy had some serious mental issues. <laughs> Fucking hell. You're telling me about it. Fuck me. Jesus. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. Like, what, what this guy essentially has done in, in incapacity. Now, of course, they had enough evidence to to look to go to trial. And, of course, that's what happened. He went to trial on April the 23rd, 2013. Thomas Dunkley, who actually began by pleading not guilty, would you be surprised? During the trial, he was accused of taking £15,000 from Sean Cummins' trust fund and £11,000 from his bank accounts. Now, after the jury deliberated for nearly eight hours, they arrived at their verdict. They found Dunkley guilty of premeditated murder. Judge Mrs Justice Dobbs sentenced Mr Dunkley to life imprisonment and ordered him to serve a minimum term 
of 34 years before he can apply for parole, which should be around 2045. Now, Thomas Dunkley, actually still alive, still in prison, still protests his innocence today. Judge Mrs Justice Dobbs said, This was a murder for gain. Even though there may have been other motivations, you may have felt you were owed money, but this is not the way of going about it. It was a grotesque act, violating Cummins' person and his dignity in death and the sensitivities of his own family. I absolutely agree with Mrs. Justice Dobbs. I, I do wonder if Justice is, is if that's her actual name. I mean, that's a cracking <laughs> name for a judge. Just getting away from from just the severity of how, how bad this was. Thank fuck they got Thomas Dunkley. Hey. Uh, they, the, the fact that they they managed to get that information that clearly said he was premeditated. What the defence lawyers or or solicitors tried to do was they they tried to pinpoint the fact that there was still no evidence from the pathologist, from the coroners, uh, you know, that, that that he had murdered him. Or they had evidence to suggest that he was thinking about it and looking at ways of doing it, but they still didn't have that evidence. And that's what they were all worried about. You know, the inspector that was running the show and, and the whole police department and the whole team who managed to source all this evidence together and put it together to put it into a crown court and put it to the judge and the jury, um, you know, they deliberated for that long. They must have been wondering if they had done enough. Yeah, you do wonder. It was definitely going to go down for fraud, but you don't want to go down for fraud. You want to go down for basically what he did. Following the sentence, Superintendent Matt Hooson of Leicestershire Police actually said, Dunkley is a deceitful, calculated and greedy man. After murdering a man who was not able to fully defend himself, he then slept at his home with the body nearby and returned over a number of days deciding how to dispose of it and cover his tracks. He then insultingly used Sean's own money he was awarded following his terrible accident to casually buy the equipment to dismember him. This was a difficult and complex investigation and I am pleased that the hard work by all those involved contributed to the outcome today but saddened that Mr Dunkley did not see fit to plead guilty and continue to lie throughout this trial. Sean's family and friends have had to enjoy the unnecessary gruesome details of his death, which I am sure is not a memory they wanted to be left with him. All I hope is they now have some comfort that the man who killed Sean Cummings is starting a prison sentence. Now, D.I. Shuttleworth explains what he believes actually happened to Sean Cummings, and he said, Thomas Dunkley may or may not have been the reason for why Sean Cummings began to feel ill. But at some point, he decides that enough was enough, and I'm going to kill him. He may have stabbed him in the neck, or in the main artery of his body. That would have left Sean to bleed to death. He then set about to cover his tracks by chopping him up, and packaging up the body parts. And I think he was still considering what he was going to do next with those body parts. So at the point that the police entered that that house and they was welcomed by the smell of death, at this point, and the fact that we knew he had sensors placed at the house so he knew people were coming and going, he had the intention to go there and some way dispose of all these body parts, maybe bit by bit, maybe you'd go and drop them in a river somewhere, maybe, I don't know what he was planning to do with them, but it was quite obvious that he was planning to to dispose of all them body parts, he just needed somewhere to store them, that wasn't too out of the ordinary, but let's be honest, this whole story is out of the ordinary, this is one of them stories that is so small in the grand scheme of of what goes on in day-to-day life, that I think it was only right that we needed to bring this to the forefront because our podcast is a, a boxing true crime podcast and this is a story that's not always as widespread as, as you would like to have expected it to have been. It was very widespread here at the time that it happened, of course, in the UK, but we know that a lot of the listeners, you, you know, you're from America, you're from Australia, you're from different parts of the world that all have your own sort of small time murders that that go on in the country on a daily basis unfortunately and this was unfortunately another one of them of a guy who was close to becoming a boxing champion ended up becoming paralyzed uh, and unfortunately was 
chopped up into 10 pieces uh, and, and probably was going to be dumped in the nearest river somewhere. It's only right that justice prevailed in this particular instance, that Thomas Dunkley was sentenced to them 34 years, which obviously now he's served seven of them 34 years and he's still in prison today, still protesting his innocence. Let's be honest, this guy's a fucking scumbag. Absolutely. He is absolute. And oh my God, I've, I've just lost for words really for how to describe this fellow, but he was not right, completely not right in the head. So, I mean, he goes to prison and he, rightly so, he's, he's, you know, he premeditated the murder, you know, he planned this. He knew nobody was friends with Sean as well. No one was coming around to visit him. He wasn't going out. It was easy. It was an easy way of him to 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 kill to kill Sean. I, I believe. I mean, the, the fact that he probably stabbed him in the neck—that's a possibility. Or caught an artery or a vein. You know, he was paralysed from the chest down on the waist down. He, he's not going to feel certain things. You know, you could cut him in certain areas, and then you could take away the phone. He can't move anywhere. So he he's going to bleed to death. He, you know, he's not even going to feel it in certain areas. So it, it, it was it was an easy way for him to kill him. Really, he could have easily done it, or he could have poisoned him. However, he done it. But then to chop him up with a chainsaw is just crazy. I I, I just can't get around it. It's just insane to think that someone would do that and blows my mind. And it's definitely a story that we had to say. We had to we had to bring up. We had to give you the whole insight of what we've managed to source. And you know, some of this some information that. I'm sure them is out there. We just haven't managed to source it. And it, maybe, you know, one thing about the Dark Side of the Box and one thing we do want to do, Sean, is we would like to, if, if any new evidence comes up, and we would like to revisit some of these uh, stories that we're telling. But this is a story that is as crazy as any other of the stories that we've done on Dark Side of Boxing. It was just very low profile. And with it being on tw- in 2012, and then obviously him getting done in 2013, obviously yeah, the Olympics going on, I think, it just probably sort of got brushed under the carpet. It was just, unless you were from the Leicester area and you knew Sean Cummings, there probably wasn't any, any real exposure. I know ITV did a little bit on it and there are some, there is some news real footage of it. Um, and they, 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 they sort of a day by day on court and what was happening on the court and stuff and evidence that was given the whole crazy story of this carer, supposed friend, Butchering him into 10 pieces after murdering him, however he murdered him, is just a crazy story. And, and hopefully Thomas Dunkley is never given parole in those 30 or whatever, 40 or was it 30, 34, 34 years? And I hope he's, I hope, I hope they leave him there to, to live out the rest of his life. Because I'll tell you what, in some states in America, mate, this dude would be given a, a, a lethal injection. Absolutely, would have been given a lethal injection in some states of the USA, and I'm sure our USA listeners will certainly attest to that actually happening. <laughs> I think the, the 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 biggest thing out of all this is obviously the fact that the you know he was a boxer. The part of the the story is that he was potentially going to fight Steve Collins for a world title. Steve Collins, as we know, was one of the great boxers in the super middleweight division of the 1990s in, in the UK, and he had some great fights with some of the great fighters of that particular era. And the fact that Sean Cummins was mentioned in the same breath as him just goes to show you that he was at one point close in his boxing career to to going on to glory he, he had a shot at a british title he had a shot at a european title he came close to to becoming a, a fully fledged boxing champion it just didn't work out that way for him and unfortunately regardless of what people might have suggested he was outside of the ring which was a bit of a shit at times nobody but nobody deserves that type of a gruesome ending especially he changed his life a little bit, according to, to many people that knew him at that particular period of time. Now, some of the information we've been able to source does come from... There's two documentaries out there that I would recommend that if you want to listen to and, and read more about and, and watch more about on this story. There's the Donald McIntyre murder files, and then there is also a independent documentary on a series called Nurses That Kill and it is based around obviously Thomas Dunkley killing Sean Cummins so there are two documentaries out there there are various articles that you can look at on the internet as well which you can have a full read of of, as to what we've sourced from Um, but yeah it's it's a different episode for us as always we're trying to bring different stories all the time this one is not as high profile and obviously 
we're not here to to ridicule the victims of these particular stories. We're here to bring light to the absolute fucking scumbags of these particular stories. And in this instance, the scumbag is Thomas Dunkler, who is serving life imprisonment. The guy is probably going to get out in his 50s. So this guy might actually still have some sort of a life unless somebody gets to him first or he decides to take it himself while he's there. But... This guy's going to get out in in his mid-50s. Maybe, I think, early 60s it'll be by the time he gets out on good behaviour. If he's being good in prison, there's, there's a chance he'll get out before he hits 60. So this guy will still get to live out the rest of his days, whereas Sean Cummings won't, unfortunately, because of this horrific act that was committed. Fight fans, this has been a, a grotesque graphic episode for you to listen to. And, of course... If you've enjoyed listening to the story, not so much about him being dismembered into 10 pieces, of course, but if you've enjoyed <laughs> the story behind it, please let us know on social media at darker underscore side underscore pod and on the Facebook page, the BTR Boxing Podcast Network. If you've not already rated this podcast, then please go and do it. Get on Apple Podcast and leave us a five-star rating. And for every person that listens to this episode... Please go on your social media account and share the Darker Side of Boxing podcast. If you're on Twitter, tag us in. Recommend us to your friends. If you're on Facebook, recommend the BTR Boxing Podcast Network Facebook page. Get recommending it. We really appreciate all the support that everybody gives to us across all the series on the network. So you've been listening to this episode of the Darker Side of Boxing, the murder of Sean Cummins.